Riverman Day is rolling on now. We're bringing in a, a more recent alumni. Of course, you know him from playing and you still see him quite a bit. He's the head coach of the Quad City Storm, former Riverman defenseman and team captain, Dave Chinichny. Chesie, how are you doing, man? I'm doing well, just uh, trying to stay warm. And or we actually have warmer climate here in Michigan uh, the past few days. So, uh, but uh, yeah, no, just uh, taking everything in and trying to look at the positives and everything right now. You got that going for you with the weather in Michigan. That's that's a rarity, is it not? Absolutely. I uh, I had to shovel probably every single day uh, except for the last two days. So it's been nice. <laughs> it's you know I'm curious what the fan perception is going to be uh, at the time of this recording we have not announced that you're uh, going to be a guest we're going to be doing that in the coming days so we'll see I mean people left you nice birthday wishes it was your birthday just a couple weeks back so hopefully it'll be good but uh, it, it is interesting right we're talking to the Quad City Storm head coach which has become the was it the Cold War on I-74 uh, these two teams don't like each other very much no and and you know it it's a game right at the end of the day but I think that what brings out the best in us is our competitiveness. You know, even as me as a coach, I want to win every night and I know the players do and obviously seeing each other so often, it's uh, it's a great thing. I think the fans love it, um, you know, and I know that there's no ill will, you know, after, after the game's done and over with, I think everybody just can get along at, uh, for the most part, but uh, yeah, it, it's a fun little rivalry. I think it's great for, for both teams, both cities. Um, and uh, yeah, just, uh, Hopefully we don't have to play each other just as much. <laughs> they, they, they've seen a, a goalie fight. We've obviously seen a ton of brawls with the two teams. There was a game in Quad City last year, and I can't pinpoint which one it was because I think our minds all became a blur once March hit. Uh, but there was a game where you and Guy, uh, at the end of a period, were having a little exchange. It looked like players wanted to separate you guys. So I, I don't know. I guess like you were saying, there's no ill will maybe before or after the game, but during it, uh, there is exceptions. Yeah, I mean, you know, Guy's competitive too, and it, it just shows that um, we could put our friendship aside if we still have one of those. <laughs> but no, we do. Uh, you know, it, it's it's great. Um, you know, and if that wasn't Guy, it was going to be somebody else, right? It, it, it wasn't. I wasn't taking exception just because it was Guy. It was, you know, heat of the moment type thing. And then I believe, you know, the next day we're texting each other and calling each other. So, uh, like I said, after the game's done and over with, there's really no ill will. And I believe that's, you know, with the players as well. They should they should be doing that, you know, just the same as the coaches. A quick little recap for people that need uh, refamiliarized with you, uh, Dave. You, you played almost 15 years professionally at all sorts of levels. I, I believe your, your height was in the AHL with the Toronto Marlies for a little bit, but long time ECHL, CHL. You were an ECHL All-Star. You were an SPHL All-Star, and you wrapped up your career your last three seasons as a part of the Peoria Rivermen, serving as a captain in that final year. Tell me, when I approached you and said, hey, I want you to come on and, and talk about Peoria, you're, you're putting on your invisible Riverman sweater one more time, what immediately comes to mind? Like, what are some of the first thoughts? Like, okay, Peoria, Riverman. Uh, man, well, you know, there's a lot of history there. Um, I played in Alaska. So um, Alaska was affiliated with Peoria and St. Louis during that season. So um, there could have been an opportunity where I had been called up you know, to Peoria uh, in the American League early in my career. I think it would have been my second year or third year, one of the two. I don't know. It's been a blur, right? You said 15 years, and I'm like, wow, it's really been that long. Uh, but, yeah, you know, you you know the history of it, right? The American League, the, the ECHL, um, the IHL. You have all these great leagues that they've been a part of, and, and rightfully so, and it's because of the fan base that's there. It's a, a blue collar town, not much different than Quad City, right? Um, you know, the fans just love seeing some good hardcore hockey, um, you know, with a little bit of finesse. But at the end of the day, it's it's what brings the fans in is the product on the ice. So uh, to be a part of that was was great because it doesn't matter what league you're in. It was you're, you're part of uh, a piece of history. So um, I had this one coach that always says, you know, if this is going to be your NHL, you, you make it your NHL. It doesn't matter what league you're in. So um, I, I truly enjoyed my time there. And, uh, you know, Carver Arena was, was, was a blessing. I've, uh, <laughs> I had a career there uh, with some of the players that had been there. Um, you know, we had some phenomenal teams. And I think the biggest regret while I was there was not uh, winning a championship. There's going to be more on that uh, in a little bit here as we <laughs> dissect further into this. Uh, 
Dave, I, one of the things too, and you know, everybody's different. There are players who um, maybe aren't uh, trying to think of the right wording. I, I don't, I don't want to say as emotionally invested, but I think there is some truth to that, right? Like there are guys that come in and it's, it's a job I, I'm here to play now. And I know I'm going to try and, you know, get out as soon as I can. I want to take the next step if I can. There are guys like that. You know that. Um, for you though, you talked about Carver Arena. There's so much history in the architecture of just that, that building. And, and you know, you look up and, uh, you know, if you come out of the Riverman Tunnel where you would step onto the ice, you, know, you take a look at your top left and you can see Dan Hodge hoisting the Kelly Cup and you can see the American Hockey League logo still embedded in that scoreboard and some of the great players over the course of that time. Do things like that matter as a player, especially coming in there? Because you were talking about that a little bit. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, um, you know, it was something to be a part of. And then you realize like, wow, I'm in the, I'm in the same dressing room as, you know, the former teams. Right. And, um, you know, that dressing room is kind of special. I've had a lot of fun in that dressing room after games and uh, also had some disappointments in that, in that dressing room. But, you know, that's where us hockey players we go to uh, every day is it, we have to go to a dressing room, right. We're, we're uh, a habit of routine. And uh, you know, I've left that place, you know, at two, three in the morning after, after a home game, right. Um, it was something that you never really wanted to leave. And I think just the tradition that's been built there and that's continuing to go there is something to be proud of, to have been there. Um, and when you had asked me to come on here, I was just honored to be even thought of to, to go on there. Cause if you think about how many years they've had this, right. I think we're closing in on 40. Mm -hmm. It's amazing that I was reached out to. So I, I, you know, very humbled in, the, in that uh, regard. So, well, you certainly earned it. And obviously getting a, a C on your Jersey for your last season as part of that, that year, uh, what a way to go out, right? I guess you want to go out on top 50 plus points as a defenseman uh, in 57 games. It's just not something that happens very often. You, you've got one of the highest point totals in a single season for a D man in that 40 year history. Uh, you talk and just hearing you talk about this too, makes me understand why Jean-Guy Trudel eventually did say, you're going to be the captain of this team. Do you remember that conversation with Guy? Uh, when did you know that you were going to wear the C? Yeah. And, you know, I've always been a player that uh, it doesn't matter who wears the C. I think the players in the room know who, but it was definitely an honor, obviously, to, to wear it. Um, but, you know, I, going back, I couldn't have had that season without some of the players that were on my team. I mean, um, you know, a lot of guys did a lot for me as far as, you know, screening the goaltender. Uh, you know, we had some big boys out in front, so it made it a lot easier to pick spots and obviously set up players that can uh, really roof the puck. So for me, it was, uh, you know, getting to see. I, um, I truly enjoyed it, but I wasn't uh, – I, I was never a vocal leader, right? Um, some people lead in different ways, and I would hope that my uh, – play spoke for itself as leadership, right? I, I did have to speak up a few times, but, um, you know, it, most of the time I just uh, let everybody else do the talking. You uh, obviously being a recent re retired, you retired at the end of the, uh, the what was it, 17-18 season, I believe. Uh, and then 18-19, of course, you go into expansion Quad City. But we know a lot of the players uh, that, that you played with, the Cody Dion's, Alec Hageman, Venice Grobas of the world, they're probably the first that come to mind just because they're still active, uh, or at least the Scroba was until recently announcing retirement. Um, do you, are, are those the guys that come to mind? Are there any other names that you think, okay, Peoria, like who is the most fun to be around in the locker room? Who are you closest with over your time? You know, we, it was a little bit different for me. I was one of the old guys, I had a family. Um, but, you know, we had Brems was an amazing leader in the sense that he was fearless. He stuck up for everybody out there. Uh, Hags at the same time. I mean, to watch him as he's progressed as a player, um, you know, from even be from the stories I heard what before I was there, right? Um, you know, it's kind of amazing. Adam Stewart, you know, Jeff Jones. We we've had a bunch of players. Kyle Rank, uh, you know, Storm Fanuf. You know, all these great players, right? And not only that, what the the biggest ingredient I took away was that it was we were good human beings, right? And that's not to say that I'm not or I am, but Guy always wanted good human beings inside that locker room. And you could tell with just the way uh, we all got together and chummed it up. Uh, there was 
always Sundays at a certain place <laughs> that we could go to. So, uh, you know, that was where you'd find us, but uh, you know, collectively it was, everybody was there from the team. So, um, there's not many teams that are like that. There's a lot of clicks, but, uh, every year in Peoria, that was the way it was. Everybody got along and, uh, and if you didn't, then you, you kind of got weeded out and, you know, it, it kind of forced your hand to ask for a trade or you were traded, but you know, at the end of the day, um, being a good human being really pays off. You mentioned Dan Bremner in there, of course, the head coach of the Roanoke Rail Yard Dogs. Very similar to you. He was a captain of the Rivermen, retired after that, and then went into the coaching world. Um, and you, you talked about Guy, Jean-Guy Trudel, and, and him wanting quality human beings. Well, I, I would think, uh, and, and I hope this doesn't come off as Riverman bias, being that I am with the team, I would think you and Dan had to have taken some things from him. Every player that I've talked to has said, you know, Guy is hyper detailed and he's so intense, but at the same time, he's really fun to be around. But his attention to detail to the game is, is really next level. Would you agree with that? No, absolutely. And, and you're right. Uh, every coach, we're, we're the best thieves, right? We always steal from each other. And, uh, you know, Brems and I actually had a talk about this. And it's, I'm like, how much are you doing of Guy's drills? He's like, every single one of them, you know, and this was his first year. So, um, you know, kind of going into my first year, I didn't want to do any of those drills because I was like, I got to be my own coach, right? But you start to realize that certain drills really make sense and kind of combine three of the drills into one. That's what he would kind of do. And uh, you hit all aspects on the ice. So that was nice. But at the end of the day, I think you, you pull from all the uh, coaches you, that you enjoyed, right? And you kind of put your own spin on it. Um, there's a lot of times where I'll take a drill now. I'll kind of make it my own with a, just a few little things, right? You could put, uh, hey, we're, we're only going to do one-timers, right? You can only score if, if it's a one-timer, right? So it kind of puts uh, the mentality of trying to push off a player, right, and create space, right? Because if you're on top of the goal, you're not going to be able to do a one-timer. But just little things like that. But, yeah, kind of, uh, you know, it's fun. I, I enjoy the coaching. And, and to be honest with you, I had a talk today with my equipment manager. And looking back, I don't – know if I'd be where I'm at right now had I not gone to Peoria because that year I went there I got there just after Christmas um, I actually took a month off of hockey because I was just kind of burnt out of it I was away from my family I just had a brand new newborn and I was I was away for uh, over 22 days and Guy was like hey come to Peoria and I'm like you know I think I might just be done and uh, my wife's like hey the kids are getting to that age where they know daddy plays hockey so I was like all right so I ended up going there and I think it might've been after the first week. He's like, um, you know, I let my players get called up, you know, that, that whole thing. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I get this phone call from a team in the coast and they're like, Hey, we want you to come up. And I'm like, mm, that's tempting. Right. Cause it's closer to home for me. Yeah. And so I kind of blew them off and I was getting some more phone calls. And then finally that same team came back with a even bigger offer. And, um, you know, it was a guaranteed spot cause one of their better, I was a veteran player at the time. Right. So that's why it was so hard to get back into the league. And, uh, you know, I just said, you know what? No, I'm, I'm good. I made a commitment. And I, I try to live as a man of my word. Um, you know, if you talk to my players, I'm a, I'm a pretty honest guy, almost too much, too honest to a fault, but um, I feel like that's the way you should do it because at the end of the day, you know, you don't want to be caught up in any lies or try to make somebody feel good. But um, you know, had I not, had I taken a call up, I don't know if I'd be, in Quad City, right? So uh, going to Peoria was was one of the best decisions, actually, for me. We've heard about players doing this. Alec Hageman is one of them. I, I think teams have stopped calling because they know what his answer is. Um, you know, Nick Neville did the same thing last year where he had opportunities. And like you, he had spent some time in the coast as well, uh, referring to the ECHL, of course. It's no longer the East Coast Hockey League. It's a, <laughs> it's a nameless acronym. Uh, but uh, Dave Chinichny here, of course, Riverman de defenseman and captain, as we mentioned here on Riverman Day. I'm curious when you talk about that commitment and, and staying by your word, did you know uh, or, or did Guy know uh, that 17-18 was going to be your last year? Uh, how, how did that decision come and then to say, and did it come as a result of a coaching opportunity in Quad City or was that not on the table? So... My first year in Peoria was supposed to be my final year. And, um, you know, I still thought I could play the game. So I'm like, all right. And I've always told myself is when I deteriorate and I, 
oh I'm not, and I'm lying to myself and I can't compete at the, at the, at, at the best I can and I'm hurting my team more, um, I was going to call it quits. Mm -hmm. And looking back on 17, 18, um, mm -hmm. I was committed to come back to Peoria. Uh, Guy actually called me. Oh, I got to figure out the timeline here. So he called me, it would have been the Thursday before game one, which was on a Sunday night. I was uh, Washington and Vegas in the Stanley Cup finals. He's like, hey, Quad City's going to be announced next week. There's going to be expansion draft. I'm going to protect you if you want to come back. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. So he ends up protecting me on the third or saying that he's going to protect me. And I think he had to have it in before Friday. So then... Monday rolls around, I get a phone call from the ownership group in Quad City. Hey, we want you to interview for the job. I'm like, I, one, I've never played for your team, right, in the past. And as a player and you're wanting to get in coaching, you always think that you're going to play for, an, you know, your alumni of a team yeah. and you're going to go there. And, it's an easier um, route. Easy. Correct. And so I go through the interview process and they're like, okay, well, you got the job. And, um, you know, it, it was interesting because I was coaching. The running joke was I was coaching, but my playing rights were still owned by Peoria. Yeah. So laughingly, I would always text Guy and be like, hey, can I trade for my rights? Um, <laughs> you know, just just to make some fun out of it, right? I go, I'll, you know, toss you a few shells here and there. But, uh, yeah, going. I, I was planning on going back. I was still training, um, you know, and, and then you kind of get tossed into this. And I always tell everybody who – goes from playing into coaching um, and if they're going to be a head coach everything that you think you remembered as a player you forget I don't know what it is you space out I talked to another former Riverman player uh, Mark Corbett mm -hmm. and uh, he, he was like I don't remember anything and I'm like I was the exact same way and then it slowly starts coming back to you but yeah I'll never forget that that feeling of like what drill am I supposed to do? Like, I know that we're supposed to do breakouts, but like, how do we lead into it? Right. So, um, yeah, I guess to make a long answer to your, to your question. Yeah. I was originally looking back and, and geese, like you'd be dumb to turn it down. So, and, and rightfully so when, and going back to thinking as a player, you're like, well, I got to be an assistant first, right. That's my foot in the door. And then I got to work my way to head coach. And then you sit here and where I was in my position I had a family of four right or my wife and two kids and it's like mm, assistant coaching doesn't pay the bills right so um you know most of the time you're doing the youth work when you're involved in that but yeah I mean I I was blessed to to be offered the job so I um I love what I do so I'm curious just hearing you tell us that story so you did not reach out to Quad City about the job they reached out to you not even knowing if you were gonna keep playing or not Right. There was also another team in the league that contacted me, ownership group, before Quad City. Wow. And that place was just way too far from my house. So I have a house here in Michigan. And uh, the silver lining on all this that's going on right now, not having a season, was I, we finally lived in our house for a full year uh, through the winter. So usually we're, we call this our summer place. Um, and my wife jokes that if we are going to ever, ever have a summer place, it should be further up in Michigan on a, on a, on the lake. So, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, um, no, I didn't reach out to anybody. I got phone calls and I think, uh, I think once you start getting those phone calls, you realize <laughs> you're at the end of your, your end of your career, I guess. But it's gotta be exciting though, because it shows that these teams obviously have interest in you. And, uh, you know, as you mentioned, I mean, before we got on here, we were talking about, uh, salary cap in the SPHL and it's something where, your, your diehard fans know just through team get-togethers and meet the team stuff, you know that you're not talking to seven-figure, six-figure salary players. Um, it's very much a love-of-the-game league, the SPHL. So when you get that opportunity to, as you mentioned, kind of bypass the assistant coaching role and get right into a head coach role, I mean, you can pay your bills a little bit easier, right? Absolutely. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, it's uh, it, it's – interesting to wear many hats as, as a coach and I'm sure as you see with Guy right we we make the trades um travel you know set up apartments every every little thing that uh probably American League ECHL a little bit some teams have the the finances to pull that off where you can designate other you know assistant coach and and, and a GM but uh yeah at our level it's you definitely love the game and um I think that's why fans like our league I, I know fans in the ECHL that will come and visit me and watch our games. They're like, 
we, we like this. It's, yeah. you know, it's, it's kind of a old school type mentality in a, in a sense, um, kind of not the way the game's going. It, there has been more puck possession in our league in recent years. Um, and I firmly believe that's because Jean Guy watches so much NHL network that <laughs> he's, he's adapted to it. And all the other teams are like, Hmm, we got to pick off what Peoria is doing. So yeah, you, you've been on the bus with him. So, you know, that's yeah. what's on. Absolutely. And after that, he's, he's gone to sleep after he watches his highlights. <laughs> yep, exactly. Uh, one of the things that you talked about there is the SPHL and its perception um, being a bit old school, almost going opposite of, you know, the current game, which you're seeing fighting uh, be less and less and the SPHL, you still have a good amount of it. But um, I think aside from that too, Dave, the league, it's, it's opposite in that aspect but it's still very progressive in the talent. Um, you know, I've been told stories and I've only been in the league for I, technically two years. Obviously this year really doesn't count. Or I'm not there seeing the game, uh, but you were in the league in, I think 2015 uh, was when you came in, you mentioned right around Christmas time and leaving the league as a player in 2018, but seeing it as a coach up to 2020, did you see the growth in talent and skill from when you came in as a player in 2015 to five years later? No, absolutely. Um, and even my brother had played in the league years before me. And, uh, you know, and it's not to knock the league, but it was a league that you didn't want to play in, right? And my first year in the ECHL, you did not want to play in the ECHL, right? And now the mentality shifted where – you want, you want to play in the ECHL, right, which, which also gets you up to the American League. But, yeah, the mentality has changed. But at the same time, I love the fact that our preparation of players that do get called up, you know, usually have an impact on the game. Unless it's, you know, for a, a weekend, you know, it's known, hey, we're here for a weekend. But if some players get called up it's and they stick, it's because, you know, they, they've learned a lot at our level. And, um, you know, hats off to all the coaches in our league, not just Guy. But, um, you know, it's nice to see, you know, goalies and, and players go up and make an impact at the next level. So as we rewind a little bit, and there's a, a bit of back and forth jumping here in this interview. Um, one of the things you talked about in the very beginning was your regret and your one regret being to not bring a championship to Peoria. Um, man, it's, it's hard to talk about this. It's almost a meme online, to be completely honest. You were there. The team went to back-to-back-to-back to back to back championships and left empty-handed in all of them. Uh, I don't know which one stings more. I, I, would, I would guess the Pensacola buzzer beater. Some people think that there actually was zero seconds left. I've heard there's a controversy around that. Um, but, of course, you met and ran into Macon and Huntsville, too, along that path. Um, I guess, tell me about the hard times and, and kind of going through those three championships. Yeah. You know, you, you almost wish as a player that was on those teams for those three years, that would have been the same team that you lost to all the time. Right. But um, you know, it was three different teams and that Pensacola one was interesting because it was the best of five and man, it, the overtimes that we lost and we had some goals that were called off and I believe it was games two and three at home. And, uh, or sorry, game two, uh, you know, it could have made a difference in that series and whether there was time on the clock, I'm not going to comment on it because <laughs> <laughs> if, if you would have dug a little bit deeper, I ended up with an eight game suspension, um, leading into the next season. So <laughs> that was, uh, that was always fun, but yeah, you know, so you, what was nice was, is you, you built that anger, uh, going into the next year, right. You have a chip on your shoulder, kind of like what, uh, Tampa Bay had recently did, you know, in the bubble, yeah. you know, they got outed in four. Um, so then, you know, we went up against Macon and oh, man, it, yeah, it, what a game that was. I mean, I've never seen uh, curved shots go in before, you know, that last game, uh, one of their players came down, I was on the bench just watching and the way the puck dipped to go in. And I'm just like sitting there thinking, you don't want to think it, but you're almost like, man, luck's, luck is not on our side tonight. And then we ended up scoring to tie it. <laughs> and I believe our bench broke or something happened. So we lose all momentum because they have to fix it. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, I'm just making excuses right at this point. But, you know, the, the better team won in, in my eyes. Um, you know, we, we were very dominant in the regular season for all three of those years. And then uh, Huntsville, uh, man, that, that first game at home, we were up, was it 5-1? 
I'll have to check this. We were, we were up by a significant, significant amount going into the third and the, the feeling in the room was really, really loose. And, uh, you know, you try to warn the players like, Hey, like, yeah, stay even keel. And, you know, everybody's still smiley. And, you know, that's the way our dressing room was for the most part. Like we'd be down and we would be smiling in the room. Cause we just, we had that swagger. We had that confidence, right. That, yeah, we're fine. We could, we got 20 minutes. We'll be fine. And uh, yeah, you, you know, goal after goal after goal. And then they tied it. And yeah. So losing that first one, right. You, you sit there and think like, had we won that game, we would have been the next night or two nights later hoisting the cup. Yeah. But we ended up having to go to Huntsville and we forced game three and, you know, game three was just one of those, Hey, a couple bounces here and there. And, you know, it's, I think they all stung, but, you know, yeah, the Pensacola one was hard, you know, but, um, yeah, to be that close three years, I, I'll never forget, we're, we're in the dressing room. You can hear Pen, uh, Huntsville cheering, right, and Scrobes, who's next to me, always, always all my three years sitting next to me, he looks at me, and he's just like, like, can we just get one? Like, how how is this fair, you know? Yeah. So I think that's what kind of lit a fire for – us to rally back and, and to come back for the next season. And then, you know, obviously I got <clears throat> handed this job and or offered the job, I shouldn't say handed, but, um, you know, and then things change, but, you know, Peoria will always be a part of, of my career and, and obviously my life because of where it's got me today. Talk, uh, as you mentioned, Ben Escroba in the locker room, um, I, I don't know, if it's easy to do this, what, what's the hardest of those three uh, to swallow of, of those three championships, both maybe from, from your perspective and maybe even like from a locker room, like what, which one was the hardest in the locker room? Oh man. Because the Pensacola make and we're on the road. I, I would probably say at home, that one probably hurts the Huntsville. most. Yeah. Huntsville at home, just because you're at home and, you know, it's, you're expected to win, but as a coach now, um, you, you realize that you don't have to put on a show when you're a road team, right? You just go out there and do your thing. It's the other team that has more pressure. So, and I'm sure that's what was said in Huntsville's locker room, but there's nothing worse than losing at home, the championship game, the deciding game and hearing the other teams partying, you know, through all the walls. I think that was the hardest one. Yeah. Well, obviously, you know, careers have, have their ups and downs and, and those being a little more negative. Uh, another one that it's uh, a negative and a positive, I guess, in a weird way. Uh, we're recording this in late February. Uh, about a month ago would have been the uh, four-year anniversary, January 19th, uh, 2017, of the Columbus Cottonmouths bus crash. Um, and uh, man, that, that's a horror story to read about. I can't imagine what it was like living through it for you guys. Um, it's a weird moment though, because, you know, fortunately uh, everybody was, was able to recover. We recently on our Down South podcast, you and I talked about before getting on air here, uh, we talked with Ben Bauer, who was on that bus uh, with the cotton mouths. But what do you remember from that day? Because there were so many moving parts. And at the end of the night, uh, Columbus is going to beat you guys until you're able to rally from a three goal deficit and score the most ridiculous goal to win the game in front of what was it? Eight, 9,000 fans. Yeah. So to kind of go back, it was, it would have been a Thursday cause we we're playing Columbus Friday, Saturday. So Thursday, I just happened to be at a restaurant with my family and I just see this bus rolled over on, on the news and I'm like, and then all of a sudden I'm getting texts like, Hey, Columbus bus crash. I'm like, what is going on? So um, I still know the uh, equipment manager that used that was there at the time. Um, and uh, he ended up getting a fractured collarbone. But when you kind of put everything in perspective, and then we obviously know what happened with the humble uh, Broncos bus, um, you just never know, right? And um, to be so thankful, I think a lot of players should be thankful to the, the, the bus drivers, right, that get us there safely. And you know, not to say that the bus driver made a mistake. It was just one of those things where accidents happen and, you know, things could get taken, uh, taken from you pretty quickly. So uh, we ended up playing Friday and then Saturday night. Yeah, we were, <laughs> we were down, we were down. And uh, we, that was a very interesting game in the aspect of um, 
coming back in front of that crowd. And to be honest with you, I don't know if, if we didn't have that big of a crowd, I don't know if we come back. I think we thrived on that crowd being there. And um, yeah, that, that, that goal was so highlight in, in overtime. I mean, uh, you know, looking back on it and it, it's, it, it's, I, I imagine most fans remember that, right. Um, you know, probably not being down, but winning the game in overtime and, and that with that many people. And, um, you know, it was just nice to, to make that and, and turn it around for, for our fans that were there that night because, um, yeah, that was the biggest, I think the biggest crowd I had played for in front of in Peoria there. Is that one of your, I mean, do you, do you have a favorite moment uh, from your time with the Rivermen? You know, that's probably up there with one of them. Um, yeah, I mean, I wish that I could say that we won a championship. I think that's the biggest one, right? Um, but yeah, I think that game sticks out in my mind. Um, there are some other ones where we came back from, but most of those were on the road. But yeah, for our Riverman fans, that definitely was uh, that comeback from uh, to Columbus. And, and our fans did an unbelievable job too, helping support them too. I don't, I don't know how many people know about that, but they definitely made sure that those players were taken care of and that were sticking around in the hospitals or if they had to stay in the, in the hotels for uh, up to a week. But yeah, it was, um, it was definitely eye opening in the aspect of uh, you never know. Right. You, yeah. you fall asleep on the bus. How many nights do we sleep on the bus and bunks and you wake up and you're at your destination. It's things that we take for granted. So, um, you know, not to get too mushy about stuff, but, um, you know, hopefully that, um, leaves some gratitude with some players, I would say. I would think so. I, I really would Dave. Um, it, you know, one of the things you talk about is the fans and yeah, that's crazy. That hockey community that came together, um, even other leagues reaching out, you know, to make sure that they could do or, or could they do anything to help out. Um, really an amazing story. Uh, talking about Peoria's fans and how crazy they are in a good way. Uh, I think the same kind of applies to Quad City. I mean, when I'm there in that booth, it is loud. You came into an expansion team that like Peoria, there's a lot of similarities there. A long history. They've been to the American League. They've been to the ECHL with the Mallards. Um, tell me a little bit, just as we, as we get to the end uh, or near the end of this interview, what, what it's been like these uh, first couple of years in Quad City. I think, um, you know, obviously opening night was, was pretty nice for us. Uh, we had a very big crowd. And then uh, obviously I always want to beat my former team. <laughs> just because. <laughs> and if I'm not doing my job, then, or if I don't want to think that way, then that's probably not proper. But um, yeah, that first night was great. Um, winning in overtime, we had to come back as well in that game. But yeah, there's a lot of similarities in the sense of the crowds, the fans, the, the boosters, the, the behind the scenes people, right? Even I'll still continue to come into um, Carver there and I still chit chat with all everybody, Zamboni drivers, maintenance, you know, ushers, just because, you know, I spent so much time there. And um, I, I was always one to take time out and talk to people that, you know, don't get much credit for what goes on. So, um, yeah, definitely a lot of behind the scenes people, especially with the fans and, and the fan base. So I think that's where um, both of our uh, organizations do so well with the, with the player interaction as well. And I think the, the players in the, at most uh, feel appreciative of it. I think one of the last things we'll end with here, uh, talking with Dave Chinichny, uh, former Riverman captain, coach of the Quad City Storm, is the – idea for gratitude that you mentioned on the bus, I think is going to be applicable when we come back. Um, because you also take for granted once the hockey season starts, it ends at the end with a championship, whether it's your team or another one. We didn't get that uh, a year ago. Um, five teams weren't able to play this year. By the time you're coming back, you're looking at literally over a year and a half, over 18 months uh, since your last game. What has that been like? And, and does it you know, as you mentioned, players maybe grew gratitude from for bus drivers. Do you grow gratitude just for having the game of hockey after going through something like this? Yeah, I, I believe, uh, you know, you should always be grateful for, for everything. And I know we do at times take a lot of stuff for granted. And, um, you know, there's a lot of players that are don't have jobs right now, right? Yeah. 
And um, I think that will obviously leak into our, our players and our athletes to be more, you know, gracious and, and acceptable of certain cir circumstances and not complain as much as they, they used to. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be great to be behind the bench, you know, whether I'm playing against Pure or whatever, it's, it's still going to be great to, to be back there and, and run the bench and, you know, just see some fans. And I know that um, there are people out there that need something to, to get behind and rally behind, whether it's the Quad City Storm or the Peoria Rivermen or whoever it is. Because um, right now that we're, we're seeing a lot of uh, mental issues, right? And I think we're like an escape, right? Our, our teams provide an escape for, for a lot of people. So, um, yeah, I'm just grateful to, to still be involved in hockey, you know, after I'm done playing, after I finished playing. And, um, yeah, I, I just, I guess right now I, I look forward to my kids' uh, hockey, so, which is in about an hour. And uh, <laughs> I, I do look forward to that because I know Wednesdays and Sundays are uh, my time to go on the ice with him. That's awesome. Well, and listen, if you're still with Quad City, you're, you're going to see Peoria again. You're going to maybe see him 20 plus times. I mean, <laughs> each season. But, uh, well, Dave, this has been an awesome time. I I've loved getting to really the chance for me to first meet you and also just talk and go down memory lane. Uh, you know, it's like you were wearing, as I said, that invisible Riverman jersey one more time. So thanks so much for stopping in here on Riverman Day. And uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll see you at Carver Arena or the Tax Slayer Center sooner than later. Absolutely, Andrew. And obviously, thank you for reaching out. And uh, it's nice to obviously meet you and not have to just hear your voice during the games when I'm cutting film. <laughs> there we go. All right. Shinichini, uh, Jesse, take care. You do the same. Thanks.